Good afternoon. My name is Dan Sheehan. I am the chief trial attorney and president of the Romero Institute. We have just filed, and the United States Supreme Court has heard the arguments on, opposing the challenge that has been raised to the Indian Child Welfare Act by the uh, American Association of Adoption Attorneys, primarily, along with the law firm of Gibson Dunn in Crutcher, uh, who are providing free uh, legal services uh, to a randomly selected white couple who were uh, denied the adoption of a Native American child. Uh, Gibson Dunn is the law firm that represents the Dakota Access Pipeline and the Energy Transfer Partners uh, who built the major pipeline uh, through the uh, indigenous territory of the Lakota people uh, just two years ago. This is the law firm that has offered its free services to challenge the Indian Child Welfare Act, which mandates that any Indian child who has been taken from her or his parents, uh, native parents, uh, by any state department of social services must preferentially place that child with one of the child's Indian relatives or that failing one of the tribal members of that Indian child. In that failing, with another member of a different tribe from the same reservation of that child. And the American Academy of Adoption Attorneys uh, filed a lawsuit uh, against the new regulations that were imposed by the Obama administration to enforce the Indian Child Welfare Act. The lawsuits were filed in six different states they were dismissed summarily in five of these federal courts, but the Texas court in the Northern District of Texas uh, with uh, Judge Reed O'Connor, uh, a hand-picked George W. Bush appointed uh, judge who has consistently ruled against every uh, moderate to liberal uh, policy that has come before him. He struck down Obamacare, he has struck down the regulations uh, allowing same-sex marriage. He has struck down the laws that uh, prohibit uh, gender discrimination against uh, women primarily. He struck down the uh, transgender bathrooms. He has struck down virtually every single progressive uh, law that has come before him has been challenged. Uh, so this case has gone up to the United States Supreme Court now. It was heard on November 9th the day immediately following the national elections on November 8th of this year. But I wanted to give you a little more detail because it turns out that it was the, our Lakota People's Law Project that actually wrote the enforcement guidelines for the Indian Child Welfare Act that were the subject of triggering these lawsuits. Because up until 2009 or so, the states were getting away with basically ignoring the Indian Child Welfare Act. It was a, a law passed back in 1978 uh, following the occupations at Wounded Knee in 1973 and the trials that went down. The United States Congress created, uh, in the wake of, of, of that uprising, uh, set up an American Indian Policy Review Commission that was chaired by South Dakota Senator Jim Aberesk, and they had two years of hearings, much to their shock and surprise, that the states were still taking Native children away and that they were half of them were never seen again, never returning. No one ever knew where they were going. We got contacted and asked to go to South Dakota to investigate what was happening with this basic uh, torrent of young children being taken, Indian children being taken away. And we went there in 2004 and we uncovered this huge scandal which was later reported by National Public Radio uh, of this cottage industry that had developed in the state of South Dakota, uh, seizing Native American children and taking them away from their parents, terminating their parental rights, and placing the children with white families, and that they were recovering up to $76,000 uh, a child. Uh, from the George W. Bush administration. This was a, a total scandal. But what happened is when the Obama administration came in, 
they contacted us, the Justice Department contacted the Lakota People's Law Project, which we had set up to try to remedy this problem, uh, and asked if we would draft up a set of enforcement guidelines that would put teeth in the Indian Child Welfare Act to force the State Departments of Social Services to enforce the preferential placement requirements uh, in the statute. We did that, and this triggered the lawsuit by the American Association of Adoption Attorneys. They now call themselves the American Academy of Adoption Attorneys, but it's the same group uh, that were making up to $100,000 apiece on each Indian child they could extract from their families and place in a wealthy white family. This set of lawsuits came down, and this one Texas lawsuit remained because uh, Judge Reed O'Connor uh, struck down the Indian Child Welfare Act, arguing that the preferential placement requiring the placement of a Native American child removed from her or his family with another Native tribe uh, member uh, was racially discriminatory against white people who decided they wanted to adopt an Indian baby. That case went all the way up to the United States Supreme Court. On November 9th, as I said, there was oral argument on this case, and I want to just briefly explain to you what the key issues are in that case and what the position is that's been taken by our Lakota People's Law Project in our amicus briefs on behalf of uh, former Senator Jim Aberesk. Number one, the adoption attorneys argued, as I said, that the preferential placement requirement that was drafted into the 1978 statute by Congress mandating that the native child be preferentially placed with their, a native, its native family, the child, or a, a tribal member or another tribal member in their reservation, or that failing before the child could be placed in a white family completely out of the Native American culture to be placed in another native family. Uh, that those, those provisions were asserted by the adoption attorneys and Gibson Dunn law firm functioning on behalf of the major oil corporations that are attempting to get all the children off the reservations if they can and uh, render the tribes defunct if they can to get at the oil and resources on the reservations. They argued this was racially discriminatory against white people who wanted to adopt an Indian child. Uh, they also argued that the mandates that the State Departments of Social Services undertake active measures to locate a native placement for the child before they could possibly ever adopt the child out to a white family, the requirement to undertake active efforts was what they called commandeering state resources because that would require extra hours of the State Department of uh, Social Services employees to undertake that effort, and so therefore it was commandeering uh, resources of the state uh, without remuneration from the federal government. Uh, they also argued, uh, based on the Federalist Society uh, uh, case that came in, the Federalist Society was behind this as well, and they argued that the, the Indian Child Welfare Act was an overbroad delegation on the part of Congress of effective legislative authority into the hands of the executive branch, in this case the Department of Interior and the Bureau of Indian Affairs that actually issued and promulgated the enforcement guidelines that we had drafted at the request of the Justice Department. So that these three arguments were made, one that it was racially discriminatory, uh, the second one that it was commandeering natural resources, and thirdly, that it was an overbroad delegation of legislative authority to the executive branch. The, these were the principal arguments that were being made by the adoption attorneys and the law firm that represents the Dakota Access Pipeline that was providing free legal services to them. We filed the amicus brief saying that this is completely untrue, that all of these things are, uh, are wrong, that the, the, since the beginning, the founding of our country, Article I of the Constitution of the United States clearly places plenipotentiary power in the hands of the federal government to regulate all conduct uh, with native tribes. And they were taking all of that authority away from the previous uh, members of the Articles of Confederation that were now the new states. That's transparently true. And moreover, that decision was not only a treaty-making authority decision of the federal government, uh, which is sacrosanct and independent of being challenged by any of the states. 
but it was also a finding on the part of the United States Congress that that was in the actual best interests of the children and that that overrode any contrary finding by the State Department of Social Services that it was somehow in the best interest of the child to be taken away from the child's entire native culture and placed in a wealthier school, a wealthier neighborhood, uh, you know, in a wealthier family that could provide better uh, living materials for the child. That was what the states were all deciding. The uh, argument that we were making is that the federal government has plenipotentiary authority to make those decisions over and against the state. And also, this these uh, commandeering argument they were making, to undertake active measures to attempt to find a, a native uh, tribal placement for the child, you know, was negligible amount of effort that had to be taken. We showed that they weren't undertaking any effort whatsoever. In fact, they were, in the state of South Dakota, they were going out of their way to avoid placing any of the children with any native uh, placement because they thought that native people were basically uh, unqualified to, to parent children. And, uh, and that was racially motivated, we argued, in, in our cases in the state. So we've, we've put in the, the, the briefs and uh, dozens of other people, the, the NARF, the Native American Rights Fund, has put in uh, amicus briefs. Many uh, ACLU people have put in amicus briefs. This has been a, a massively legally briefed case in front of the Supreme Court. And it was so important that the Supreme Court granted up to three hours for the oral arguments in this case. We tried to craft an argument that would gain at least five of the nine judges. Uh, and we believe that the arguments that have been crafted by all of the amicus uh, briefs here and the major principles, including the Biden Justice Department, have been all on our side. Chase Iron Eyes, uh, who is our uh, counsel in the Dakotas, uh, worked on this case uh, with all of us. I wanted to come together today with you to just give you a fuller briefing on what's happening with the Indian Child Welfare Act in the United States Supreme Court case uh, from the Lakota People's Law Project. Uh, thank you very much for your time.